So this is EE619, lecture 10. So a quick announcement, we will have a mini quiz next week on Tuesday evening, same time from 5.45 to 7.15. So on, on Tuesday, not on Friday. Any concerns? So we'll, the quiz is from 6.30 to... Any other academic clashes at the same time? No, right? Okay, good. So coming back to the lecture, is there a concern with the timing? Okay. So coming back to the lecture, this is going to be our last session on CMOS and Vertus. So we'll start with a quick recap. So in the last class, we were mostly focused on calculating the propagation delay of the inverter. We saw that an inverter driving a capacitor C can be modeled using an equivalent resistance, either a PMOS equivalent resistance or an NMOS equivalent resistance driving a capacitor C. Now for the calculation of TPHL, which is high to low, we know that V0 of T can be written in the format of VDD into E power minus T by tau, where tau will be equal to R equivalent into C and TPHL is given by 0.69 into tau. Similarly, for the calculation of TPLH, again, we are representing V0 of T because it is an RC network in the form of VDD into one minus E power minus T by tau, where tau is equal to 0.69 into Ah, is it R equivalent N or R equivalent P? Okay. This is signal going from low to high, which means the capacitor is being charged through the PMOS. Right? So this will be 0.69 into R equivalent P into C. So this I can represent as tau N. This is tau P. And the total propagation delay TP will be given by 0.69 into tau N plus tau P divided by 2 which is same as 0.69 into R equivalent N plus R equivalent P into CL divided by two, okay? So then we saw that in the presence of interconnects, it is not correct to model it as a first order RC. This becomes a much more complicated network consisting of at least two capacitors and multiple resistors. Then we saw that Looking at the expression for V0 of T for such a higher order RC network resulted in very complex expressions and very fancy expressions for the time constants. So we said we are going to approximate this to have a first order response given by, so again, I'm assuming a rising edge here, given by VDD into one minus E power minus T by tau, where we paid some special attention in calculating this tau. What is this called as? This is equal to the Elmore delay. And we saw how to calculate the Elmore delay by taking a specific instance for calculating tau. And then using that, we figured out how to get a generalized expression. For any node given an RC tree, we now know how to calculate the time constant. So once you have Elmore delay, your propagation delay, let's assume that we are writing for TPHL or TPLH, this can be given by 0.69 into tau. Now, all of our calculations were done assuming step inputs. If we were to assume a finite rise time for the inputs, the TPLH value will approach the value of the Elmore delay, which is why in some cases you will see that this 0.69 is being dropped and TPLH will be directly equated to tau, okay? So, for this course, wherever you are calculating, we will differentiate between the Elmore delay and the propagation delays unless it is specifically mentioned, right? So you put 0.69 and then calculate the delays. So I'll specifically mention the point from which we will start ignoring the 0.69. For now, you can still use the equation 0.69 into tau. Okay. So then we moved on to the power consumption for a CMOS inverter. So first we were looking at the dynamic power consumption. So 
So this is the power that was required to charge or discharge the capacitor. And what is the expression of the dynamic power? Alpha PVDD square into F, where alpha is the activity factor, C is the total capacitance at the output, VDD is the supply, and F is the clock frequency. Then we move down to the short circuit power. So this is the power that results due to a current flowing directly from VDD to ground. So when you have a current that goes from VDD to ground, you have the short circuit power. And when do you have this? When both of them are on. So when you have an input edge like this, during these transition phases, where your output is greater than VTN and less than VDD minus mod VTP, both the NMOS and PMOS are on. So during this transition is when you will have a direct current between the supply and the ground. And this causes a short circuit power consumption. What is the expression? There will be an activity factor into IP, VDD minus 2 VTN into the rise time of the signal into the clock frequency. Okay. So now we were listing out. Sorry. So we have the activity factor alpha one. So why should be T rise plus T fall? Right. So we calculate the energy associated with one transition, right? And then we multiplied it with the clock frequency. And alpha one is for the activity factor uh, to uh, take care of the switching rate, total switching rate. Okay. So now we were looking at the factors on which PAC, the short circuit power, was depending on. So we first saw that it depends on the rate at which the circuit was switching. So that is, it depends on the alpha 1 and F. It, of course, depends on the supply voltage. Correct. Yeah. So in both the rising and falling edges, it, we have to take care of the. So the fact that in the uh, in one period it is happening twice was already taken care of during the derivation. Right. Okay. So the short circuit power depends on uh, alpha one f VDD. Does it depend on the W by L? By the, how does it depend on the W by L? Because the I peak value will be a function of W by L. Then we said that it also depends on the input rise and falling edges. So the time taken for the input signal to rise as well as fall. Now, I had asked you to think about whether this depends on the output rise and fall times. So let us look at this in detail. Now, before that, let me establish a small fact. OK. What comment can you make about the current flowing through the NMOS and the PMOS? Would that be equal? Let's assume that we have a rising edge at the input. Okay, corresponding to that, we expect to see a falling edge, which means the capacitor current, the capacitor charge has to be now discharged through the NMOS invert, NMOS transistor. So let me assume a capacitor current IC. So the value of IC will actually be negative because it's flowing in the opposite direction. What is the current flowing through PMOS during the transition? I mean, you can tell the name of the current. I don't need the exact expression. You will have the short circuit current flowing through the 
and PMOS. What about the NMOS? So it will be short circuit current minus IC. The direction of IC has been taken like this. Right? So now if we are interested in analyzing the short circuit current alone, which transistor's current should I be looking at? Only PMOS, right? Because the NMOS has both the discharging current as well as the short circuit current. So PMOS has only the short circuit current, whereas the NMOS has two currents, right? So it's easier to just focus on the PMOS for this particular example. So I have shown IC in this direction. IC will be a negative current, right? IC because it is a capacitor current. So IC will be equal to C dv naught by dt because v naught is increasing, dv naught by dt will be a negative value. Is, is there any confusion here? If so, I can simply replace this as I discharge, where this is the direction of I discharge. Oh. So now we are going to analyze this case for two conditions. Now case one is when RC is very large. Okay, so we take the inverter. We apply a rising edge here. If the C is very large, what comment can you make about the falling edge? Is it going to be fast or slow? It's going to be very slow, right? So now let me plot both the curves one below the other. So my V in is like this. Now I'm going to draw a very slow V out. Okay. Now let us mark the points where both the transistors are going to be on. So in the VN plot, I have to look at VTN and VDD minus mod VTP. Let us look at the output voltage corresponding to these two points on the input. Okay. You can see that it is still very large the output voltage V0 is very close to VDD. So far, okay. Now for the PMOS, what comment can you make about the source to drain voltage during this duration? It's almost zero, right? So what region of operation will PMOS be in? It will be in linear region. And what comment can you make about the short circuit current? It's in linear region with very small VSD. The short circuit current will be very small. So almost close to zero. Right? VSD is close to zero. Therefore, the linear region current is also going to be very close to zero. Which means your short circuit power consumption for this particular case is going to be very small. <laughs> Okay, so this is a case where the input rising edge is relatively sharp and the output rising edge is very, very slow. It has a very small slope. Now, can you analyze the case wherein the input rising edge is uh, decent enough while the output rising, output falling edge is very sharp? So please analyze and tell me what comment you can make about the short circuit current. Feel free to discuss with your partner. So I'm drawing the same V in as before. Sorry, small c. But because the value of the capacitor is very small, I will have a sharper falling edge. So I again mark VTN and VDD minus mod VTP.
and you get your V out to be very small. It's almost close to zero. This is the highlighted region now. Okay. Now for the PMOS, what is the VSD? This will be almost close to VDD. What region would it be in? Or yeah, it is in one of the saturation regions with relatively high current, which means you will have a relatively high short circuit current and therefore your short circuit power consumption is also going to be high. Now, based on this, for an inverter, how should you choose your input and output edges? Should it rise fast or rise slow? For a single inverter, what should we do? If I want to reduce the short circuit power consumption for a single inverter. <laughs> so you should have sharp input edges. And slowly varying output edges. Is this okay? Now, is this what you should be doing in a design? Why not? Correct. You will never design a digital circuit with just one inverter, right? For example, you could have one inverter which is driving, let's say, three other inverters. And maybe this inverter is driving few other logic circuits. Maybe an inverter, NAND, NOR, another inverter, etc. Now, let's say this was the inverter under consideration right now. If you make its input edges sharp and output edges slow, sure, you will be able to save on the power of this particular inverter. But this output edge is the input edge for four other gates, right? Therefore, the short circuit power consumption of all these gates is now going to shoot up, okay? So then what should you do? You make all the edges as edges as sharp as possible. Now, if it is not possible to make it even sharper, you make sure that for every gate, the slope of the rising, the slope of the input edges and the output edges are of similar order. Okay. So this is one example wherein if you're too focused on a smaller part of the design, like improving the power consumption of a single inverter, you can end up with a global solution, which is much inferior. So you will have to simultaneously pay attention to the individual modules, as well as the short circuit power consumption of the overall full design, right? So from the full design's perspective, you should try and make sure that the input and the output edges have similar rise and fall times. That is a better solution. Is this okay? If so, we'll move on to the third part of the power consumption, which is the leakage power. So you guys already know about the subthreshold conduction. Let me also explain few points regarding the junction leakage. So when we consider an NMOS transistor, this has a P-type substrate. Then you have two N plus regions with the oxide and the gate. So if I were to look at the drain body interface, you see that this is an N plus P region, which means you will have a diode that is connected in this fashion. Okay. So now let's say I use this transistor to make an inverter. Now I basically have a diode connected from the drain to the ground in this fashion a reverse bias diode. Similarly, you can go and analyze for the drain of the PMOS transistor, but you'll find that there is another diode 
connected in this fashion here. So now you have two reverse bias diodes connected between the supply and the ground. And you will have a reverse bias current in this direction. The current values will be very small. It is negligible in a lot of designs, but it still exists. Right? So the important point about this current is that as your temperature increases, this current is also going to increase. So our typical operating temperatures, let's say we are operating it in the room temperature, the actual junction temperature is going to be much, much higher because you are dissipating, you have a lot of transistors put in a very small area and they're all switching very fast. Therefore, since a lot of power is dissipated in a very small area, it is going to produce a lot of heat in that small area. So the junction temperatures will typically be much higher than the room temperatures. It can easily go from 50 to 80 degrees Celsius, which means your leakage current can also be higher. So now I can represent this P leak as some I leak into VDD. There is no need of an activity factor here because this leakage current is present at all times. It is irrespective of the switching activity. Let us write the expression for the total power consumption. This has a dynamic power component, a short circuit power component, and we have a leakage component. So this is alpha CL VDD square into F plus the short circuit power is the activity factor alpha 1 into VDD minus 2 VTN I peak into T rise into the clock frequency plus we have an I leak into VDD. So now we are going to have a lengthy discussion on how we can optimize this power consumption while also keeping an eye out for the delay. So I want all of you to take two minutes and make a list of variables that you can change such that you can reduce this power consumption. Also figure out what is going to happen to delay as you change that parameter in the direction in which you want to reduce the power. So you make a list, then we can have a discussion and then you can see how many of these points you got it right in the first place. So yeah, feel free to discuss again. So look at, for example, if I were reducing the VDD to reduce power, you should know what is happening to delay, right? So you have to consider all the small nuances involved. Sorry? CPLH, both the delays. Not the slope. We are looking at the propagation rate. So they are related, right? If your signal is rising very slowly, uh -huh. propagation delay will also get affected. So let's see what all points you have got. <laughs> so let's start with VDD. Right? Now, if I reduce VDD, what happens to the power? So the overall power reduces. What happens to the dynamic power? It reduces, but is it linear? It reduces quadratically. There is a square term, right? What happens to the delay? Can you say with confidence that it will increase? So do you remember when we plotted the delay versus VDD and you also calculated the R equivalent, we saw that if your VDD is much, much greater than VTN plus VD sat N by 2, then the delay is going to stay roughly similar even when you reduce the VDD. So your delay is going to look like this. And then as you approach the value of VTN plus VD sat N by 2, then this can start to increase, right? So your delay may or may not increase. It depends on the relative values of VDD and VTN plus VD set and VT. So technically, you have the option to keep reducing your VDD till the point your delay starts to increase. Right? Because you're not gaining much by having a larger VDD. And in fact, you are losing out on power savings. 
And now the last point is that this BDD could be determined by the overall system specifications, which typically happens. So you will have multiple designers designing smaller modules within a big design. And there'll be one person who will do the top level architecture and say that all of you will have to design with a BDD of so much value. Now, as an individual designer, you may not have much say in the value of the VDD. So then you will have to use other techniques to reduce the power consumption. So VDD could be fixed by other constraints, such as system level constraints. Because now if you ask for a lower VDD to the system designer, they have to figure out how to put an additional LDO on chip which may not be reasonable depending on the area available and other constraints available. Sorry, uh, low voltage, uh, low dropout, uh, low dropout regulator. Yeah, it is for, yeah. So this is a supply regulator. Okay, so now what comments can you make about CL? The total capacitance at the output, let's say C total. Should we increase it or decrease it? So you should decrease C dot to have lower power. And how do you determine uh, the C total capacitance? What does it depend on? It depends on the transistor sizes, right? So it depends on the W and L of the transistors. And if I reduce the capacitance, what happens to the propagation delay? That also decreases, right? So overall, this is a win-win situation. You have low power and you also have better performance. Okay. Now let us look at what we should do to the length of the transistor. Any comments? It is typically element, but now we are looking at why it should be element, right? With a little bit more detail. Let's say I'm increasing my length. What happens to the C total? This will increase, right? What happens to the equivalent resistance? This will also increase. So if I increase the length, C total is increasing, which means my power is going to increase, right? Both C total and the equivalent resistance is increasing, which means your propagation delay is also now going to increase. So really there is no benefit in having a larger L. So we keep it to the minimum value possible, which is why in digital designs, we set it to L minimum. Is this clear? Now let us move on to the width. Any comments on what we should do to the width? Make it? So there is an option. Huh? There is a trade-off. What is the trade-off? Okay. So what statement are you making? If I increase the width, the total capacitance increases, power increases. Huh? So we'll come to that. Let me first note down this. You increase the width, the total capacitance is going to increase, which means your power is going to increase. Now, if I increase the width, what happens to R equivalent? R equivalent decreases. What comment can you make about the delay? So delay is constant is one answer I'm getting. Is that true for all values or is there a, is there a, is there more nuance to it? So let me sketch out an inverter. Let's say this is driving some other inverter. Let's say this is the R equivalent we are concerned about right now. And say the width of this inverter is Wn. Okay. Now the capacitance at the output is basically sum of two capacitance. The self capacitance and the capacitance due to other stuff like uh, wire parasitics as well as the fan out. So let me split it into C self 
for now we'll consider the interconnect capacitance to be zero. So you have C cells plus C fan out. Is so much clear? So now I can write the delay as some 0.69 into R equivalent into C cell plus C fan out. Now come again, if I increase WN, what happens to R equivalent? R equivalent reduces, C cell, C cell increases, C fan out. C fan out is unaffected because we are not changing anything about this inverter. So now we can analyze this for two cases. So case one is where C self dominates the total capacitance. So now my TP can be written as 0.69 into R equivalent. So I take out the dominating capacitance C self. So this becomes one plus C fan out by C self. And because C self is much, much larger than the fan out capacitance, you would expect this value to be much, much smaller than one. So effectively, this factor is almost equal to one. So now can you tell me when you increase the W, what happens to the propagation delay? Yeah. Correct, we are changing. For it, let's assume that WP and WN are get changed by the same factor. We would generally scale both the transistors by roughly the same factor, right? Yeah. So then this will remain constant, right? Because as you increase your W, your R equivalent is reducing, but C self is increasing. So on an average, the propagation delay is going to remain the same, right? So now this is giving you a very interesting point to note. That is in any given technology, there is a minimum delay that you can achieve. For example, if I start with 180 nanometer, let's say I designed an inverter and I find that the delay is around 100 picosecond. So to reduce the delay, I will increase the width. Let's say the delay reduced down to 90 picosecond. I increase the width again, the delay reduces further. But around the time you hit 40 to 50 picosecond, you'll see that even if you increase the width further, the delay is not going to reduce because you have hit this limit where the change in increase in C self is simply cancelled by the decrease in R equivalent. So any given technology you know, you will have a minimum delay that you can achieve. If you try to increase the width further, you will simply end up burning more power. You don't get a performance benefit. Okay. Now that said, there are techniques by which you can get delays lower than that, but that is not a regular CMOS inverter. You will be utilizing some analog techniques to achieve smaller delays. So we talk about a minimum gate delay. And then you can use uh, analog techniques to go further. That is usually uh, proportional to power. I mean, the more power you burn, the better benefit you can get. Okay, let's quickly look at case two also. So in case two, your C self is much, much smaller than C fan out. And I can directly write this as 0.69 into R equivalent into C fan out. So you will be able to find a similar factor, one plus C self by C fan out, which will roughly have the value equal to one. Okay. So now here, when you increase the W, your R equivalent is reducing, C fan out is unchanged. So when a fan out capacitance, when anything other than the self capacitance is dominating, when you increase the W, you will be able to reduce the delay. Okay. So now here is a question. Let's say you have designed an inverter and you see that when you increase the width, your delay is not changing. At that point, what should you do to the width? Should you retain it as it is, increase it or decrease it? Retain is one answer. Is there another answer? So you have an inverter, right? And you notice that as you increase the W, the delay is not changing, right? Now the question is, should you retain the W? Increase the W or reduce the W? You have three options. Reduce, why? Because you are already in the regime where the self-capacitance is dominating. 
which is why when you were increasing the width, you were not seeing any benefit. So at this point, it means that you are probably burning more power for the performance than required. So the technique to do is you keep reducing the width till you notice a change in delay, till your delay starts to increase. Then you stop at that point. That is the optimal W for optimizing both the uh, power consumption as well as the delay. Is this clear? For this case, so what happens is you will keep reducing your, uh, you will as you increase the TP, your R equivalent is reducing. Your C self is also increasing, but that increase is negligible compared to C fan out. So the full expression is, so if I write C fan out here, This is the full expression, right? So as you keep increasing the W, your C self is increasing. At some point, this factor will become the dominating factor. So till that happens, you can keep uh, increasing the W, you will see a benefit in the propagation delay. Once you hit this limit where this is now equal to one, then you are moving into this regime where the self capacitance is the dominating capacitance. Is this clear? So now let us move on to the next part, which is related to the switching, right? The rate at which you are switching the circuit. So this corresponds to the activity factor as well as the clock frequency. What should we do? Should we increase or decrease the switching rate? You have to decrease the switching rate, right? But now this is a problem that might not be completely under your control, right? This is related to how you can do optimization at logic as well as at architectural level. But of course we can straight away make the statement that you have to use the minimum frequency possible. So if you can meet the specifications for which you are designing at 500 megahertz, no reason to try and design a circuit for 600 megahertz. So you design it for the minimum frequency else you will be burning unnecessary power. Now the other aspect is, let's say you have this big design and you have multiple blocks operating within this and say all of these need to operate at some FCLK. You could also have other blocks in the circuit that can operate at lower frequency. So I could have a divide by circuit here and then run the rest of the circuits at FCLK by two. Okay. Now, if you can still meet your design specifications with such an arrangement, you should go for it. So you don't have to operate all the circuits at the same frequency if you are able to meet your specification with some of the blocks running at a lower frequency. Now the only constraint is this, you will be burning some power in this divider. So the divider power plus the power consumed by this uh, these logics when they are operating at FCLK by two should be smaller than the power consumed by these logics when they are operating at the full frequency. So this is something that you'll have to check. Anything else that you can do? Have you heard of the term clock gating? What does it mean? What do you think it means? It's clock and gating, two terms. Take a guess. Cut off the clock, so, yes, right. So we are simply going to control the flow of the clock to the rest of the modules. So like I mentioned earlier, if a circuit has a sleep mode or a power down mode, you need not be providing clock to all those modules during the sleep mode. So you can technically have a switch here and then turn the switch off 
when these modules need to be powered up. Okay. Now the actual circuit will not be a simple switch. You have what is called as a separate gating circuit. This is necessary because clock is a very sensitive, very important signal, right? If you switch off the clock arbitrarily in between a rising or a falling edge, you could be passing a glitch into the rest of the circuit, right? So if you wanted the clock to be cut off like this, right? But if you cut it off prematurely in between, you could have something like this, right? So this is what we call as a glitch, uh, unrequired transition for a smaller duration. So to avoid these glitches, you have a uh, specific gating circuit architectures, which you would put here. Okay, so now this is about the switching rate. Now to reduce short circuit power, we already discussed what should we do. Okay, what comment can you make about the rising and falling edges in the circuit? Please refer to your notes. So we are looking at different ways in which we can reduce the total power, right? Is there something we should take care about the rise time and fall time of all the signals? Factor of T rise is there. So what should we do? So have sharp edges, that is point one. There was one more statement I made. Yeah, so have sharp edges. And then have equal rise and fall times at the input and output. So of course, it might not be possible to make it exactly equal, but at least make sure that they are in similar ranges. Now to reduce the leakage power, what all can you do? You have to minimize I leak. What can you do to do that? So I mentioned that this is a function of the temperature, right? So when you choose a packaging for the IC, I had shown you an IC package in the first class, right? So you choose an IC package that will enable quick removal of the heat. Okay, so that is one thing. So you choose the right package. Right? And much like clock gating, there is something else called as power gating. Right? Because it is in power down mode where you don't have any switching activity happening, that the leakage power is likely to dominate. So what do you think power gating means? Oh, so you have to disconnect it from VDD. Right? So you're thinking of something like this. You have your circuit and then connected to the ground. Now, how will you implement the switch? Using a transistor. Let's say I use a PMOS. And then you're going to turn off this PMOS. Now, if the PMOS is in cutoff, basically it could still be conducting due to subthreshold leakage, right? So there is still some leakage involved, but you can design your circuit carefully. Uh, it, it still gives you much more benefit than not having the switch, right? If you design it properly. Now, I'll not get into the details of this, but those of you who are interested can look into the terms called as sleep transistors and stacking. This is power gating. The idea is this, you have a switch to control the uh, connection of the circuit to the VDD or to the ground. And you can look at what is meant by sleep transistors and stacking. So some of the benefits are coming because due to stacking, your source to bulk voltage is not going to be zero. So your threshold voltage will now increase and that gives you some additional benefit. Now, if you remember, when we discussed about the subthreshold leakage, we had done a plot of log i versus VGS. Okay. 
So we saw that it had a linear relationship in the subthreshold region, so roughly till VTN. And then it uh, had the quadratic relationship. And so uh, this was exponential relationship. Therefore, in the log scale, it became a linear relationship, right? So now with scaling technology nodes, generally our threshold voltage is also reducing. So is there a benefit in reducing the threshold voltage? What is the benefit? VDD can be reduced. So for the same VDD, is there a benefit in reducing the threshold voltage? Right, so you're on current, right? The on current is proportional to VGS minus VTN. So if you reduce the threshold voltage, you will have a larger on current, which means faster switching. But as you reduce the threshold voltage, this particular curve is now going to shift to the left side. So you'll have a curve like this. It has just shifted to the left side, right? So now your off current is larger. So you can use low VT devices, threshold voltage is low, for cases where you need a better performance, smaller delay. Now, a lot of PDKs will also offer high VT devices. Now, if you have the choice where power is a concern, try and use high VT devices. Where delay is a concern, you can use the low VT device. So I just wanted to show you that this whole design process where you optimize the power and delay, it's it just doesn't depend on only the designers. So you need to have good foundry engineers, device modeling engineers, designers like us, and even packaging experts to make this whole system work. It's a big ecosystem that relies on the expertise of everyone in it. Okay. So now you can go back to the list you prepared and see how many of these points you got right. So now let's say I have two inverters, inverter one and inverter two. This has a propagation delay TP1, let's say at 10 picoseconds. This has a propagation delay TP2 at 100 picoseconds. Which is a better inverter? Inverter one or inverter two? Inverter one, right? It has a smaller delay. Now let me also put down its power numbers. Let's say this has a power of 100 microwatt. And this has a power of 50 microwatt. Sorry, this has to be higher. Yeah. So this has a power of, uh, say, 2 milliwatt. It's a very high number, but let's assume that is the case. Now, which is a better inverter? Depends on the application. Let's say I am a, a IP vendor and I'm trying to sell these two inverters. So for which inverter should I focus all my attention to? I'm selling this to a lot of people, right? So in which inverter should I put all the advertising money on? Because the second one has a reasonably well uh, delay as well as the power numbers, right? So what did you do to say that the second one is better? Both numbers are smaller, right? So you relied on a metric which used both the power as well as the delay information. Okay? With this, we come to some of the metrics that are used for comparing such logic gates. The first one is called as power delay product. Or in short, it is called as PD. Okay, so in even in the current designs, among all the power terms, you will see that the dynamic power contributes most of the power, then comes the short circuit power, and finally the leakage power. So we are going to focus 
our efforts in the dynamic power when we discuss about these metrics. Okay, so PDP is now given by alpha C VDD square F into the delay TP. Okay, for now we'll assume that the inverter is switching at its maximum rate, meaning alpha is equal to one. Can you tell me what value of frequency I should use? So this is now a metric using which I can compare different inverters, right? So what value of frequency should I use? One by TP, why do you say one by TP? Huh. So is that the fastest at which it can switch? Let us confirm that, right? So let's say you have the you have a rising edge at the inverter. Now, this is some TP L into H from the input, right? And then you will have the falling edge associated with it because it is switching at its fastest rate. So it rises and then it immediately falls. This is TP H into L, right? And then it repeats over and over again. So what is the minimum time period that is possible? Right. So that is TPLH plus TPHL, which is equal to twice of TP. Okay. So now what should be the value of F? So F can be replaced by 1 by 2 TP, this into TP. So this gives you half into C VDD square. What should be the unit of PDP? Is this power or energy? This is energy. So this will be represented in joules. So what this PDP is telling you is the total energy consumed per switching event. Okay. okay. But you can see that we started off wanting to compare both the power as well as the delay. And when we derived the final expression for PDP, the delay information was missing. So now what should we do? If I have to define a new metric, what should that definition be? So the problem is our delay information is missing from this metric. So multiply this with the delay, right? So this is now uh, energy. So if you multiply this with the delay, it becomes the energy delay product or EDP. So EDP is simply your power delay product into TP, that is half CVDD square into TP. Now, once you have such a definition, what is the optimal value of the supply to maximize this energy delay product? So should you be maximizing it or minimizing it? It's an energy delay product. Is it better to have it as a high value or a low value? You want to minimize it, right? So again, you can apply the same principle. You can simply take the derivative of EDP with respect to VDD and then equate it to zero and find out at what point of VDD, at what value of VDD, you can have the minimum uh, energy delay product. So let us quickly do the calculation. So let me first derive the expression of EDP in terms of VDD as well as other constants. So this is equal to half C VDD square into, what is the expression for TP? 0.69 into R equivalent into CL, where R equivalent is three by four VDD by I naught. And if I assume that it is still in velocity saturation through that entire duration, this can be written as mu n COIX W by L, which I'll simply write as beta into 
VD sat n into VDD minus VTN minus VD sat n by 2. To make my calculations easier, I'm going to call all of this together as some VTE. So VTE is VTN plus VD sat n by 2. So this is equal to, let me put all the other constants together as some alpha into VDD minus by VDD minus VT. So the energy delay product can now be written as alpha by 2 into C into VDD Q divided by VDD minus VT. So can you quickly do this calculation? Take the derivative of the energy delay product with respect to VDD, equate it to zero, and find out the optimal value for VDD. So what did you get VDD optimal as? We should get 3 by 2 Vt. Now, of course, this calculation has ignored the short circuit power as well as leakage power. In the presence of those two, your value is expected to change. And you can think about in which direction it is going to change, whether the optimal Vdd is going to increase or decrease. So let us quickly do uh, some problems. I'll stop the recording here.